Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have one of our special podcast guests. She is a part of our podcast community. She has her own podcast on The Advisor, and her name is Ellie Young. And she's an alcohol-free life coach and hormone balancing expert. She's amazing. And today, she's going to talk about the three most common beliefs about keeping you in keep, to, from keeping you stuck and in in your in the drinking cycle. And she is just truly amazing. Her knowledge is beyond belief. And I'm so excited to have her today to talk about this subject. And Ellie, could you tell everybody a little about yourself and, you know, and the, the topic about, you know, about keeping yourself stuck in the dr drinking cycle? Yeah. So thank you for having me again, Stacey. It's an honor. And I'm really looking forward to the podcast series that we're going to do together. Um, you know, in our last episode, I shared a little bit about my story. So I'm an alcohol-free life coach and a hormone balancing expert. So that really is kind of summing up my story in a nutshell is that I got alcohol-free in 2020 after essentially pickling myself during the pandemic while I was homeschooling my two young boys. And after getting alcohol-free, I, I went on this kind of wellness journey. And I think a lot of women will relate because I was entering perimenopause. I was turning 40. And my body was changing. I had no idea the impact that alcohol had had on me, not yes. only my mental health, my physical health, and also my hormonal balance. So I really started going down the rabbit hole with per understanding perimenopause and hormone imbalance. And I became an expert as well in not only getting alcohol free, but balancing your hormones as a way of healing. And um, most women everything that we're struggling with in this decade of life can really be chalked up to two things. One, you're drinking too much and yeah. it's impacting your hormone imbalance, which is so critical in these, in these years when everything is starting to change and it really does impact your overall health. So my message and my mission right now is to just wake women up and say, you, one, you don't have to suffer this decade of life. And two, let's examine that relationship with alcohol and, and really break down these beliefs that are keeping you stuck in the drinking cycle, believing that alcohol is serving you in some way, because mm -hmm. for so long, we have not examined these subconscious beliefs. They are just right. that they're deep in our subconscious. They've been conditioned into us and We've never looked at them. We've just kind of followed suit with the rest of the culture that is yes. obsessed with alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's so true. And, you know, like I was telling you before the show, I had some hormone issues. And the first thing the doctor had said to me was, OK, no alcohol. And because, you know, it plays a humongous part role in our bodies it throws a lot of things off and you know we are a drinking society everyone you know there's you know there's a lot of people in, in in our country who like to drink but there are a lot of problems that go with it and you know people don't realize the impact it could have on your body when you're doing it too frequently and you know so it, it's it's something that's really important and i like the fact that you know you're talking about how, you know the you know the beliefs in, in keeping yourself you know not stuck in the in drinking cycle now can you explain to people more in depth about what that really means yeah so the program that i coach people through it's is really a three part system and the first part of this is to really tackle the mental side the mental cravings that keep us so attached to alcohol. And I've developed my own little method here for breaking down these beliefs. I've adapted it from the program that I was trained in, which is This Naked Mind by Annie Grace. And people will also recognize similarities to the work of Byron Katie, if people have read that book. Um, yeah. so I've, I've adapted it to fit my own um, way of coaching. And so I call it the AIR method, A-I-R-E. And what we do is we take these subconscious beliefs and we, A, become aware of them first and foremost. We pull them out of our sub subconscious and we really look at it like, oh my gosh, this is the belief that is keeping me craving alcohol. And the most common one that everyone will relate to is alcohol helps with my stress and anxiety. I need yeah. it to relax. It is a reward at the end of a long day. It's how I reward myself on vacation, how I celebrate. We tie it to 
a way for our, our brain and body to relax. And so if we, if we go through that method, we would a become aware of this belief. Okay. Every time I crave alcohol, it's because I believe I am due a reward right now. And I want to treat myself to something. Right. And then right. what I, the next step step of this is then to, I investigate that belief. When I think this thought and when I believe this belief, how does that actually make me behave? And it's like, yeah. well, I go to the, the liquor cabinet and I pull out my cocktail mix or I go buy a bottle of wine or I plan to get drinks with my girlfriends or I plan to buy a bunch of alcohol for this party. So believing that we need alcohol to celebrate, you know, that thought alone make creates behaviors in us, Right. And so we start to make the connection between just a thought we're having and our actual physical behavior. Mm -hmm. So we go, okay, I'm investigating that. The next part of this is the R, replace the behavior or re rewrite the belief. So we start to go, okay, I now know, well, this part of this is breaking down the science of what alcohol actually does to your body. So we did this in the first episode, but what I do with my clients, and we can go into it again, is we break down what alcohol is really doing to your body. Is it really helping with your stress and anxiety? Let's examine that. And when I teach the science to people and they learn that, oh my gosh, actually it's raising my adrenaline, raising my cortisol, leaving me chronically anxious. It's waking me up at 3 a.m. with anxiety. We start to make those connections and we go, okay, that belief isn't true. It does not help with my stress and anxiety. What- yeah does. And so we rewrite that belief and we say, alcohol does not help with my stress and anxiety. And we have to really like let that sink in. Right. And I can go through the science again, if you'd like with it, with the dynorphin, um, why, what alcohol really does to us. But basically once we rewrite that belief, the next, the next step of this is E evaluate. Okay. How does this new belief sit in my body now? How to right. test it out here. How am I going to behave with this new belief? When I now believe alcohol does not help with my stress and anxiety, you know what does? A walk around the block, some sunshine, um, a snuggle with my dog, a snuggle with my kids. Like that helps lower my cortisol, not right. drink alcohol. So going through this method, um, awareness, investigate the belief, rewrite and replace the belief and then evaluate how this new belief behaves in your body. And so we're going to do this with each one I'm going to talk about today, but you can jot it down while you're listening. And it's it's just an exercise, a practice that you can go through to really stop yourself from acting impulsively, where you're not thinking, you're not consciously choosing these things. You're like, it's so subconscious because it's been so programmed into us for such a long time that we we don't even think about it. And right. That mental piece of this is so important because that is what our willpower is up against. So right. many people go into like a break from drinking and they think I'm just not going to drink for 30 days. This is exactly what I tried to do for all of, you know, all of my attempts at taking a break. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take a week off. I'm going to take 10 days off or whatever it was. And eventually I'd hit a point where those mental cravings were so strong and I would eventually just talk myself into it. It wasn't this like alcoholic behavior where I'm waking up and drinking early in the morning. It was this little tiny voice that would start talking to me like, you've been so good. You deserve a drink. It's five o'clock. Why not have that drink right now? Um, yeah. That slowly just chips away at you because that structure in your brain, that subconscious programming that has been living in there for your entire life, it's really big and strong and it yeah. will overpower any conscious desire you have to take a break. Right. So the purpose of this mental work is to really deprogram those subconscious beliefs that are keeping you in that craving mode. And right. we have this opportunity to really like Okay, you, you really have to come into it with an open mind because a lot of times people are like, what do you mean? It's a wedding. Like, this is how you celebrate. You have to have a glass of champagne. Like, what, you can't have a glass of champagne to celebrate? Who are you? And it's like, really examine that. Like, why does ingesting a neurotoxin that's mm -hmm. gonna wreck your sleep, that's gonna bloat you, that's gonna mess up your gut health, your hormonal health, your mental health, why is that a reward? Why yeah. is that something that we celebrate with? Yeah. And so you go, oh, 
ah. And so sometimes these little lights just start to go on and click on for people and they think, okay, okay, let's back up here and say, how really should I reward myself? Like yeah. I reward myself with a pedicure. I want to reward myself with like, you know, a, a break. How about just like a break from your kids and, you know, a night out with your girlfriends, but without the alcohol. Um, yeah. It really does take this kind of deprogramming of, of those subconscious beliefs. So the second belief that we can get into and work through the air method here is, so we just did alcohol helps with my stress and anxiety. Now we can get into, I need alcohol to socialize, right? Mm -hmm. This is probably the one that hangs around the longest, the one that's the hardest for people to debunk because we started drinking probably in our teen years right. and all through college, all through adulthood, there hasn't been a single social occasion that right. doesn't center around alcohol. And whether or not we were a big drinker or not, that belief is really ingrained in us that if you are socializing, there's alcohol involved and yeah. it's become a crutch, right? We mm -hmm. think that we need it in order to socialize. And so this one, again, we, we create awareness. Okay. I understand like, Oh, I'm maybe I don't, I, I don't drink at home, but anytime I go out to an event, I feel like I'm not going to have a good time unless yeah. I drink the alcohol. Aha. Uh -huh. Awareness right there. So we think about that and we say it out loud. Go, oh, look at that. I think I need alcohol to do this. Then we investigate that belief. How does yeah. that belief make me feel? Okay. When I believe that I need alcohol, to socialize, that makes me not have a good time if I decide I'm going to not drink. I think, oh, it's going to be so awkward. It's going to, you know, I'm not going to have any fun. I'm going to be bored. And so when we, again, this thought is now triggering this behavior, it's creating yeah. this confirmation bias. This is why this mental piece, again, is so important. Our thoughts are dictating our behavior. If we think we're not going to have fun when we don't drink, we won't have fun. Our right. brain looking for evidence to support that. And yeah. so look at that. That belief is making me not have a good time when I try not to drink. Let's replace and rewrite that belief. So we think, and, and also I want to point out to people, like when you really think like, I can't enjoy myself without mm -hmm. this beverage, that's, right. that's worth examining, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. if a beverage is dictating your joy in life, yeah. That's, that's something to check out, right? The world is big and beautiful. There's a whole lot of life. And at what point did we shift? You know, when we're children, we have so much fun. It didn't matter. Alcohol wasn't even a, a, a figment in our imagination, right? And at some point that shifts to being like, I can't have fun unless I'm, I'm drinking at this event. Right. And that's a really like that, that fact alone, again, should be another aha moment for people. When did a beverage start to dictate my joy? Yeah. Um, and so we've replaced that belief and say, I don't need alcohol to socialize and enjoy myself. You know, right. what, what do I really need in life? And the thing is, oh, with a lot of these social occasions, you're, you're simply removing the alcohol. Everything else is still there. The people, the environment, the music, the good times, right? And, and so when you really look at it like that, what do I really enjoy about this? Oh, I enjoy seeing my friends. I enjoy laughing. I enjoy the food. Um, it's, it's not the alcohol that's delivering all this joy in life. It's a yeah. trick to our brains. It's tricking us by, by toxifying us into yeah. believing we're having this great time. Mm -hmm. And this can be a bit of an awkward moment for a lot of people, because when you do go out into these settings and you're like, okay, you might find out that you really don't enjoy these places and these people and these things, and that yeah. can be uncomfortable but at the same time, you go, what do I really like? What do yeah. I enjoy? And so it's this return to self, this return to knowing yourself again and being like, okay, there was a person in here that had interests, that had passions, that didn't revolve around a beverage. And yeah. like, I want to go live that life right now. Um, right. And so during this, this belief, I really, I help people hack into, okay, let's visualize. Because you could hear me say it all the time. You can have a really good time alcohol free, but until you go out and prove it to yourself, you're not mm -hmm. going to believe it because you're, you have decades 
of evidence thinking I need alcohol to enjoy myself. So we yeah. now we debunk that, but we have to go prove we have to visualize ourselves enjoying ourselves alcohol free. You have to really close your eyes and picture it and create that neural pathway of you yeah. having a non-alcoholic beverage in hand, laughing, um, you know, smiling, connecting with others, and then going home and sleeping and feeling great in the morning, right? Go through the whole, the whole picture. That way you really understand the reward you're giving yourself is like, I'm going to have great sleep. I'm going to, you know, keep my integrity. I'm going to be able to work out in the morning. I'm going to feel great. Um, and so all of those things are part of this new reward we're building in. And so you evaluate that new belief, like I can have a good time alcohol free. Um, yeah. And so that visualization is really, really key. And then um, I also ask people to think about these places and these environments that they are so geared to drink in, right? And they say like, how could I possibly live my life and not right. drink these occasions. And what yeah. I want to kind of crack open this possibility is that like your life is not going to be the same exactly. and that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. You are going to change the yes. places you're going to go are going to change the people you're going to hang out with. And some people are so tied and so afraid of that change that they say, yeah. I just can't, I can't do it. But again, this open mind is so important because the change, while it might feel uncomfortable, it, it doesn't have to be negative and it can yeah. also be temporary, right? You might say, I just can't hang out with this person or be in this place right now. But right. eventually when I feel stronger in my choice and I feel more comfortable, I can go back to that place and I can right. feel okay. Um, yeah. And a lot of times the awkwardness that people feel in these social situations early on is really you think everyone's thinking about you like, oh, what? you're not drinking. Like why? You know, there's, there's lots of funny memes out there about like, you know, you're not using mayonnaise. Why? You know, like alcohol is really the only thing that people really invent. Like, how could you not drink? It's so different. It's so, you know, unless you're pregnant on antibiotics or like super recovering from some sort of illness, everyone right. just assumes. And then if, if, then they're like, what problem? Like, it's all a hush hush. There's a shame yeah. attached to it. And so that's yeah. part of my mission is to really like, hey, let's normalize not drinking because yeah. you feel good <laughs> because, right. hey, you don't have to have a dark story. You don't have to have some sort of shameful like thing. And, and while I wouldn't categorize myself as like a quote unquote alcoholic, I definitely had darkness to my story I definitely had self-medicating to my story which a lot of people do but we've yeah. normalized that as well we've been yeah. conditioned to think it's all safe that yeah. all of our drinking behavior is really safe unless you're a brown bagging it on the street corner and you're waking up to drink every morning the, right. those lines in the sand have really done us a disservice um and so what I say to people is like let's forget the shame let's forget the labels and just mm -hmm. say, can you enjoy yourself alcohol free? Yes. And yeah. if you really want to say I can't because of a beverage, then that's mm -hmm. worth investigating. That's worth checking it out and with no judgment. Don't look at yourself and be like, oh, what's wrong with me? Why yeah. is something wrong with me? And it's again, that is something the alcohol industry has done to us. Yes. As a way of marketing, they put their little label on the bottle that says drink responsibly, meaning it's on you. And right. if you, you can't drink responsibly, that's your own fault. There might be something wrong with you. You might mm -hmm. be one of the unlucky ones. And that's yeah. all bullshit, right? Alcohol is a addictive drug. And it, yeah. it does this to every brain, not just your brain, not just unlucky brains. It does it to all the brains. And yes. so- you know, addiction is really much more tied to ACEs, um, alternative childhood events, whether whether or not you'll become addicted and right. um, frequency and volume. And mm -hmm. so even if you haven't had really traumatic things where you're really coping to numb out the conditioning that we all go through in our lives to drink, it's we are all affected by it. And 
over time, it does, it just, whenever you start your drinking career, we're all on the same slope. We're all just at different points. Yes. And, and so it's, it really is, an, is something to kind of pay attention to and to just say, Hey, wouldn't I feel better without alcohol in my life? Let's check this out. And you're not sacrificing any mm-hmm. fun you are gaining so right. much. Um, so I kind of went off on a tangent there with that one, because that one is the the one people struggle, struggle with the most, the social aspect. Do you have yeah. any questions about that part piece of it right now? Oh, yeah. There's many times where I didn't really want to drink, but people are drinking around me or I had people like kind of, oh, come on, come on, have a drink, have a drink. Or I didn't even have people when I was turning around talking to somebody else. Another friend of mine was pouring alcohol in my glass, you know, or I had maybe like a little alcohol and that's all I wanted to drink for the day. And then they're pouring pouring it to the top and I'm not even realizing it so you know it's like um I think social pressure even with friends and they don't mean any bad intentions I think I think it, it's very hard you know they said you want to be a follower or a leader you know and you have to try to feel like in leader mode you know and be able to stand up for who you are and what your values your core values are and this is who I am this is what I want to be and this is what I'm going to do you know but many of us sometimes fall in that following category and we feel awkward when we're the outcast you know everybody's doing you know everybody's drinking having a good time they're eating laughing and you know you're like ah you know like sometimes we all loosen up when we have alcohol too and we we are more funnier and we don't feel as stringent you know and then some people feel like oh I can't be that that joyful person like you were talking about before if I don't drink you know people might not like me as much because I'm, you know, I'm not really serious when I drink and I am serious. And, you know, my characteristic is a little bit serious when I'm sober, you know, so there's a lot of factors that go into it, but, you know, I think, I think, you know, when you're in a social, uh, you know, a social area, it is hard, I think, for a lot of people to say no, you know, and, you know, there are many people I know that will say no, but there are a lot of people, I think, that will, you know, kind of fall into, all right, maybe one, you know, and, you know, sometimes one leads to two, and then two might lead to three, and then three is going to give you a nice big hangover, you're not gonna be able to get out of bed in the next morning, but, you know, um, and, but people don't realize too, the, what it's doing to our body. And I like that you mentioned that because that's another thing, you know, especially when, as we're getting older, you, you know, you're not like you're 20 when the next day you can pop out of bed or, you know, and, and you feel fine. It's, you know, it's people sometimes take two to three days when they're older to recover from one night of drinking with their friends, you know, and it's so imagine what it's doing to your body if you have to have two to three days of recovery or you're out for the whole day maybe you go out Saturday and Sunday you're not doing anything because you have no energy you just sluggish you can't think you have a headache there's something your body's trying to tell you something there you know it's giving you a message and we ignore those messages a lot of us and that's when we have to really step step back you know before it's too late you know because i've some meet, known many people that have had problems from drinking and it's led them into a bad road and i've had people that i known that passed away from liver damage from drinking you know so I think, you know, that talking about the pressure of socialization is important because I think that's where most of us will fall in if we will give in. Yeah. You know, um, people might not recognize this. I'm going to point it out real quick. The three beliefs that I'm breaking down today are where, you know, these beliefs kind of stem from. It's one, there's beliefs about the substance itself, the alcohol. So I need alcohol to help with my stress and anxiety. We believe the substance is actually doing something for us. Yeah. The next layer of beliefs is about society. I need it to fit in socially, right? And the third belief we'll tackle is about the self. There's something about the self. Like I believe I'm not enough without this alcohol. Like I need alcohol to be some person, some way, right? To change my state of being. And so I'll get into that one next, but- I wanted to come back to, you know, you mentioned like getting out of your shell, right? A lot of people think, oh, I'm uptight unless I drink alcohol. And again, this goes back to the fact that we were all introduced to alcohol kind of in our teen years when we're ripe with insecurities and we don't learn how to socialize without alcohol. And so it becomes this crutch. 
And what it's doing to us is it's actually dulling our inhibitions. And some yeah. people think that's a good thing, right? Like, oh, I, I, I want to lower my inhibition so that I can be myself and can come out of my shell and I can laugh and I can let, you know, let my guard down. Um, and so this is again, another one that I want to kind of flip on its head for people and be like, your inhibitions are there for a reason. Yes. That is your prefrontal cortex. That is mm -hmm. the most evolved part of your brain trying yes. to protect you. And while yes, we probably haven't learned to manage our anxiety, our social anxiety ever, because we've been drinking in every social situation ever. So yeah, there is going to be some awkwardness, some anxiety and stuff, but there's a million other healthy ways to manage that. And it does take time to kind of untangle it and to grow more confident in your alcohol-free self. But to yeah. but to say that I should be inhibitionless, that I should quiet those inhibitions. And I think, you know, this is particularly important for young women, right? Who yes. have, you know, insecurities about their bodies. Perhaps they have insecurities being intimate. And so they mm -hmm. think like, oh, you know what? I really need to like lower my inhibitions. Yes. They're, th they're there to protect you. And right. to dull our body's own warning system to say like, oh, I'm going to quiet that, maybe that, it, that instinct that's telling me maybe this person's not safe. Maybe I don't want to be doing these things. Maybe I don't want to like make these choices. And so mm -hmm. that's a big one for me where I think back to like my college years where, you know, yes, we are going with the flow. We're going with the masses and yeah. we are quieting this part of our brain that is saying, Ooh, I'm not so sure about this. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so that evolves into like us being adults being like, Oh, I'm uptight and I'm no fun unless I'm drinking. We think right. like by saying I'm not drinking that we're putting some sort of stake in the ground saying I'm going to be no fun. And that's right. really not it. And, and again, this is a learned thing that we have to really break open our subconscious and go, what do I really like to do for fun is sitting yeah. in a bar for three hours fun. And it's like, no, like I want to be outside. I want to get some sun on my body. I want to like go explore. And you know, yeah. that, that part of um, the journey gets to be really exciting if you let it. And again, it comes down to that confirmation bias. What are you telling yourself? Are you saying I'm not going to have any fun because I'm trying not to drink for 30 days? Or are you telling yourself, I'm going to go explore what else is in this life? outside of the bottle, right? Yeah, and your whole world opens up. So it's it's a really actually cool part of the journey if you can tweak your brain a little bit. And that's why this part of the process, we have to do it first. And, and it's so, so important. And it's ongoing. You know, you'll be doing this for years um, in your journey because you'll an old craving will come up and you'll go, huh, what is that little voice trying to tell me that alcohol is the answer for right now? And you get yeah. a chance to go through this air method of like breaking it down and going, let's rewrite that belief because I know alcohol is not serving me. What belief, what thought can I now replace that with that will serve me? Yeah. This is, this is neuroplasticity. This is mm -hmm. how we change our brains. This is how we change our behaviors. And this little method, you can really apply it to anything, not just drinking. It can, you can apply it to any habit. You can apply it to food. We, we, I do a lot of it with food and the hormone balancing part of my work. Yeah. Um, but let's move on to the third belief, which is, um, again, it's very similar tied to what you were saying there is um, alcohol makes me happy, right? Mm -hmm. I need it to experience joy in my life. And right. a lot of people will say, well, you know what? I just, I, you live only live once. Like I want to enjoy myself. What's, what's the harm in having a few drinks here and there? And right. I, I will, I want to say first and foremost, you don't have to be like me. You don't have to be like, I'm never going to drink again. Nobody likes to hear the word never. Um, and I don't ever say I'll never drink again. But I I tell people that you can just, however you are feeling in your relationship to alcohol is what matters most. If you say, I'm only going to have a drink here and there on special occasions. Again, I would poke holes in that idea of like, why does alcohol make an occasion special when it's yeah. actually making you sick? But um, then we say, Okay, if you're okay with that sacrifice, my yeah. husband, right? He will still make a, you know, on occasion drink, but he knows that it's coming at a cost and he's under no illusions that it's doing anything for him, right? 
And so if if you're okay with that, by all means, keep living your life that way. But if something's not sitting right with you, if you're like, man, I told myself I'm only going to drink at this special occasion. And then I ended up really hungover. And then I didn't like, I wasn't able to take care of my kids and I wasn't able to go work out. And I feel like shit for three days. And that really bums you out. Yeah. Then maybe let's look at it. And right. no shame in that. That's alcohol doing what it's doing to a human brain. It's not mm-hmm. your fault and there's nothing right. wrong. But if you want to change it, these are the things that you need to investigate. Um, yeah. And this one, the alcohol makes me happy. And so this one, I'll go back into the science. I said I was going to do it with um, that stress and anxiety one, but I'll go ahead and do it now. So um this is what alcohol is really doing to your biochemistry. So in the first 20 minutes, it raises your blood alcohol level Mm -hmm. and it releases a big boost of dopamine. This is what people experience as the buzz, the euphoric kind of carelessness, right? And after that 20 minutes wears off, the brain is course correcting because it recognizes it's out of balance. And it says, whoa, whoa, whoa. it's like a seesaw. It says, okay, so we're going to release dynorphin. This is a Mm -hmm. neuropeptide. It behaves like the opposite of endorphins. So it counters that good feeling with bad feelings. It makes you feel anxious, lonely, uncomfortable, a little depressed. Mm -hmm. This is the buzz wearing off. And so we go get another drink. This is the cycle, but the brain is really adaptive and it will not release the same amount of dopamine this time because it says, whoa, 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 we don't want to get out of balance like that again. So we're only going to release a little bit, but it continues to release the dinorphin. So that is alcohol is considered a depressant. It takes you up and then the next drink doesn't go as high and it starts to pull you lower and lower and lower. And so- your baseline dopamine now is much lower than where you started. And the brain counters this low by releasing adrenaline and cortisol, which Mm. is why you wake up with 3 a.m. anxiety, which is why you experience anxiety for days after you drink. And question again, does that make you happy? Did alcohol really bring you joy? Or what is the what is the net effect? And so we have a hard time correlating this because that buzz, that 20 minute buzz that we're trading essentially for three days of anxiousness in our body. And that's assuming you only drink one night, you know, right. if you're drinking multiple nights, you know, oh, I only drink on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah. that's going to linger in your body well into the next week and leave you yeah. one with depleted GABA, which is a feel good um, you know, ingredient in your body, it's going to leave you with depleted dopamine. And yeah. it also affects your ability to experience joy from other things. Right. And that is why when you do get a significant amount of time under your belt, alcohol free, little things start to feel good again. And mm-hmm. they call it the rose colored glasses effect or the pink cloud effect. And that's like where you're all of a sudden walking around and you're like, oh my gosh, the flowers and the sky. Yeah. And you don't even have to have been like a a really gnarly bad drinker to experience this. This is essentially your pleasure circuits are resetting and your body is now able to register these little blips of dopamine because it's no longer being blown out by tons of alcohol. Um, This is a function of tolerance. Tolerance for alcohol affects tolerance for anything that will give you dopamine in your life. So all of a sudden, you know, the little stuff doesn't feel good anymore. And this is where you get the really sad, depressive drunks, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. So true. It's, it's, you know, I think it's really hard, you know, that's when addiction kind of sets in its way too, is that people don't want to feel that down feeling. They don't want to feel, you know, they, they, and when they get that down feel where they start to feel the sadness and they start to feel, you know, depressed and they start to feel, you know, those maybe feelings of loneliness and they start to think negative thoughts, you know, and they want to get rid of that. And then they, they go back for the alcohol and then Mm -hmm one, they're back, you know, they're back to consistent drinking. So, you know, what might be start weekend drinking could easily and has for many became Mm -hmm. every day, you know, bad habit. And then, you know, from there on, it became, you know, it it became an addiction, you know, and it can easily become an addiction, addiction, you know, and many people have addiction qualities, you know, and, and 
it's so easy, especially if you have addictive tendencies, you know, to get addicted to alcohol. And, you know, and I think that's the, that's why people get addicted so easily is because they get that high. And then when that low starts to come, they grab the alcohol and they want another glass and, you know, they don't want to feel that feeling. But when you think about it, like you said, how long does it really last? 20 minutes, you know, you're feeling good. And then it starts to wear off. And then what? You know, if you're still out with your friends and you want that feeling, you're going to go for the second one. And like you said, it's not going to be as big of an effect, you know, and, you know, and then you're, you know, three days, your body is out of whack. You know, if, if I went drinking, you know, for one night, you know, and I had a drink on a Saturday night and I had maybe more than one drink, I, it would take me, it would take me three days to get my body to get back to the way it was, right. you know, from the day before. And that's crazy when you think about it, like how hard is the body working? How many things is it affecting for yep. my body to have to, you know, take that long to recover, you know, yep. and that's yeah. scary. Yeah. And that's why um, this, this work, this part of it is how you actually break free from just having to use willpower to try and change this habit. Because yeah. when you start to really break down these beliefs, like, no, it's not helping with my stress, my stress and anxiety. It's making it worse. No, I don't need it to socialize. I have to kind of relearn how to socialize and no, yeah. it's not making me happy. It's actually depressing me. And yeah. when you have that information now sitting in your subconscious and starting to like really work on you, it mm -hmm. no longer just takes willpower to yeah. abstain. You're now you have this subconscious thing driving your behavior and you're like, I know this isn't working for me anymore. Right. And it's an uncomfortable place to be. And it can still take a lot of time and a lot of awkwardness and stuff. But the more you have that information strengthening your subconscious, you're going to, it's going to get easier and easier and easier. And, and then when you start crafting this new life that is rewarding and that does feel really good to you, you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, why would I go back? Why right. would I? back to this way of, of life. And, um, and addiction is interesting because, um, you don't, you, it, it's, it's so riddled with shame for people that they don't want to talk about it in that way. It scares people off. And so I actually don't really use a lot of it. I, I talk about it just to bring attention to it. And I talk yeah. about word alcoholic to bring attention to it, but I, I really want to say that, there is no criteria and there is no like, Hey, let's, let's, let's fill out this questionnaire and say like, Oh, only if you cross over into this threshold, do you really need to like examine your relationship? It's like the world is, everything can be so much better. If you remove alcohol, it doesn't matter if you drink one drink a week or if you drink 10 drinks a week, right. this, this life that you're pursuing, and this is all in that mindset shift. It's not about depriving yourself. It's about what you will gain and yeah. more you can think about everything that you want in your life. Like I want good health. I want great sleep. I want really beautiful relationships. I want to have great relationship with my family and my children. I want to set a good example for them, right? All of these like really big life goals will all be improved if you, if you eliminate alcohol in your life. So oh, it's not I like, Hey, you have a problem you need to change. It's like, no, I want all these things. I'm pursuing all these things in my life and alcohol doesn't fit. Alcohol yeah. is detracting from all of those. And we yeah. don't, even, we don't even realize how much it's been affecting our mental health because we haven't given ourselves a break long enough to have that perspective. Most yeah. women I know struggle from anxiety and depression. And a lot of women are on medication for it. And there's no yeah. shame in that. But if they did ever give themselves a break from the alcohol, they're going to see such a lift in their mm -hmm. overall mental health. It will right. blow their mind. It will literally, I mean, it blew my mind. My mom suffers from severe anxiety. It's its in my family line, intense anxiety and depression yeah. and alcoholism. They've never decoupled the two, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the first one in my family line to really break this chain. I thought anxiety and depression were coming for me. Yeah. I was in my early forties. I could feel it. I could feel this 
instability creeping in there. And yeah. yet I was just drinking, thinking right. that was helping me get through this stuff. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I broke free long enough and I started mm -hmm. feeling more stable. There was no high highs and there wasn't low lows. It was just like everything was just smoothed out. Life is still hard. Don't get me wrong. I'm still a mother of two children who are like wild and crazy. I'm still mm -hmm. in a marriage that we have, you know, we struggle with things, but I'm so much more able to tolerate it because yeah. I'm on this roller coaster of alcohol, just, you know, completely destabilizing me all the time. Right. You know, there's probably so many people out there that, you know, suffer from depression and anxiety due to the alcohol that they're drinking. And they probably don't even realize it. They just attribute it, like you said, to either in their family genes or, you know, maybe, you know, things are going on in their life or, you know, it's, you know, this condition I have and blah, 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 you know. And it could be just, just the alcohol that we're drinking. That's really throwing our whole body off, you know, I think I want, you know, I, I wonder, you know, what it does to our brain chemistry after having alcohol for X amount of time for a long, you know, for a long standard amount of time, you know, even if you're not drinking tremendous, but you're drinking on a constant routine basis, you know, what does that do into your brain? What is, you know, it, you know, it cuts off the oxygen to a lot of things when we drink. So, you know, what does it do into the brain? It actually shrinks your gray matter. Your brain stops, stops growing, which, you know, some will say, if you're not growing, you're dying. Like it really stunts us. And it does that by, again, it's taking offline your prefrontal cortex. This is the most evolved part of your brain where like, all of our decision-making, all of our impulse control, you know, all of our rationale and reasoning is coming from this part of our brain. So it's like you go, it's like you cut off your evolved brain and you go back to like basic caveman instinct mode where you're yeah. just, and that's, and that's why bad stuff happens when people are drunk. There's drunk driving, there's rape, there's abuse, there is, you know, you name it, any bad yeah. thing going on in, in this world, alcohol is involved. And it's because right. it's taking, it's cutting our brains out. And, and the good news is though, it's not all doom and gloom. You can, when you, if you just a minimum of two weeks, alcohol free, your brain matter starts to regrow again. So oh, wow. that's a really incredible thing. The liver also is this incredible, like regenerating organ, um, you know, 30 days alcohol free, you're going to see significant improvements in your body's ability to eliminate toxins. A lot of people are like, Oh, you know, I, I was really lucky. I, because I think I worked out so hard while I was still drinking. That was my way of punishing myself for drinking yeah. too much as I would make myself sweat. I probably detoxed a lot quicker than most people would, but right. um, some people it can take, you know, 30, 60 days, but you'll see this massive improvement, like all of a sudden, because the yeah. fatty liver is all of a sudden able to start detoxing because wow. it, it doesn't have to prioritize detoxing the alcohol as much anymore. Um, wow. And that's something we'll get into in our hormone episodes is that for women in particular, this is why we are so much more susceptible to the effects of alcohol and um, addiction is because of our hormonal health. And it's, it's the impact that it has on our liver because mm -hmm. estrogen needs to be detoxed from our body in the liver. And so all the different fluctuations throughout the month, if the liver isn't able to detox estrogen out of our body, not only yeah. does it create estrogen dominance, which is responsible for all of our bad PMS symptoms, it yeah. also estrogen, excess estrogen in the body raises our cancer risk. Yes. And so our worlds are incredibly toxic, whether you are doing your best to eat, you know, organic and exercise and buying all the clean products. There is still just like microplastics. Our worlds are stressful. There's, you know, there's antibiotics in our food. There's, you know, you name it, pesticides on everything. Um, and so our, our liver really needs to be able to detox that stuff out of our body. And if it is chronically detoxing the alcohol instead, that stuff is sticking around in your body and it raises your cancer risk. It's yeah. just, it should be the biggest public service announcement for women. Eight yeah. out of 10 breast cancers are hormone receptor positive. That means they need estrogen to grow. And mm -hmm. if we're drinking, our liver can't detox the excess estrogen out. And that is why you see such a prevalence of women 
getting breast cancer. It's, it's scary. That is scary. That is scary. That was a fact that I didn't know. So, wow. Yeah. You know, we have, cause you know, breast cancer, there's so many women who suffer from breast cancer and, you know, the numbers go up every year, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's scary, you know, yeah. but you know, when you just think of that fact alone, it makes people think, you know, especially if you have it in your family, then you're really going to think twice, you know, do I really want to drink? Do I really want to put this in my body? You know, yeah. cause so many people that have it prevalent in their family and you know those those are the people who have to be extra careful you know especially in a toxic world that we live in today and you know if they did make that public you know which I don't think they're going to because you know they make so much money off of alcohol but you know if they did I think people would, would have a second thought a lot of women would think twice about you know how much they put in their body or if they're going to stop completely yeah, yeah, we can get into that more. I have a I have a whole podcast episode on alcohol and um the cancer risk as it relates to estrogen. Um but that's definitely something we can cover in our next one. I've got a lot of statistics that are unsettling for people, yeah. but they need to be heard. And again, it's this kind of information that you can hear and it's like you only need to hear it once. And right. that will change your subconscious behavior for a lifetime. It's one of the, some of the facts now that I hold on to because I'm like yeah, of course. Why would I, why would I put this stuff into my body anymore? And it's not about me not having fun. I have an incredibly fun, amazing life now, but yeah. it doesn't involve me toxifying my body. Right. Definitely. Now, if you had to take everything we learned today and you wanted to like, you wanted to give people like a couple of takeaways, like what are some things that you think are really important that people should emphasize that we should, you should emphasize to people? Yeah. So if you are going to get started on making a change to your relationship with alcohol, you need to start with the beliefs that are keeping you in craving mode. And you can, you know, I went over the three most common ones today. Alcohol helps with stress and anxiety. I need alcohol to socialize and alcohol makes me happy. You can spend some time jotting down what are the other reasons that you drink? A lot of times there's like, you can have a laundry list of reasons why you drink. You can also have a laundry list of reasons why you fear not drinking that are almost equally as important. Like I'm afraid if I don't drink, I won't fit in or that I won't have fun. So you can, the fears and the whys you drink, make that list and you're going to start to see a theme of a subconscious belief surfacing that is right. telling, hey, you believe alcohol is going to help with X and- mm -hmm start to debunk that like does it really does it really help or is that just something I've been conditioned to believe and so right. we didn't put these beliefs there it's the world we live in and you get yeah. it, that little gap now in that little you know automatic behavior is now there's a little space in there for you to go okay what can I replace this with what can I start telling myself that is actually going to better serve me and that is going to help me in these moments make a better choice for myself right. exactly. and the second the second part I would say is visualize, visualize yourself being able to do these things. The more you can picture yourself actually having a good time, alcohol free, making the right choice, pouring yourself a mocktail, whatever that is, visualize it so that the brain has seen it. And yeah. so it wants to make that vision a reality because if you're only focusing on the negative and like, I'm not going to have fun, this is going to be awkward. Your brain is trying to make that Right. It's looking for evidence. So we want yeah. to use confirmation bias in our favor. We want to paint this picture of our alcohol-free life being awesome and badass and let our brain try to prove that to ourselves. Let our brain start looking for like, oh yeah, this is cool. Oh yeah, I am enjoying myself. And, and your whole world opens up, but it really does start with this mental work. And where I would direct people if they want more work on this, this is exactly what I do in my coaching program. So um, I have a, um, it's called the brave course and it's at my website, findmyselffree.com and they can go and this course will take you through the exact lessons that not only I used to get alcohol free after decades of gray area drinking, but that mm -hmm. I continue to fine tune and tweak with neuroscience and positive psychology so that it yeah. is like, not only are we breaking this, this habit, we are building a life that you don't yeah. have to escape from anymore. Right. 
That sounds awesome. Now you do the coaching. Are there any other services that you have? You have the program, you do coaching. And are those the two things that you do? Do you have anything additional to that? Yeah. So um, after alcohol is out of the way, or if alcohol is not playing a big impact in your life, I have a hormone balancing program. And actually I'm starting a course, um, a challenge next month for July. It's called the balance challenge. And yes, it's an alcohol-free challenge, but our main focus is to work on hormone balancing. So I take you through cycle syncing, which is essentially changing your nutrition and your lifestyle and your exercise to support you hormonally. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really awesome course. We have a big community of women. I have a live um, kind of community chat portion of that where you can post, hey, I'm on day 17 of my cycle. What should I be doing? And so I come on live on there with coaching videos and I say, here's what we're doing for, you know, you're in your early luteal phase. This is ideally how you want to support yourself hormonally with your diet, with your nutrition. Um, and it's just a really cool way, I think, in a community to, to say, hey, we're all in this together as women. Let's share what we're going through and see what works for everybody because no two bodies are the same. But creating awareness of what your body needs hormonally is huge. Most women haven't paid attention to really what's going on with their cycle unless they're trying to actively get pregnant. Besides, right. we're all just kind of in the dark and we wonder why we we get crazy at certain times of the month. Hmm. Um, and so yeah, that is a, that is called the Balance Challenge. And that's at my website as well, findmyselffree.com. And so you could either join the Brave course to get alcohol free, or if you want to work on hormone balancing, we do the um, the balance challenge. That's awesome. I think it's so important because I think so many women have so many questions because I even remember I did a speaking engagement and I was talking about relationships and I briefly brought up menopause and relationships and all of a sudden all the questions started because people don't know, people don't understand, you know, and so a lot of times people are embarrassed because, you know, they're embarrassed to mention that they're going into perimenopause or menopause or they're starting to, you know, move forward in, in all these different changes are happening, you know. And, you know, it's, it's, it's important if you could have a place to go where you could have other people that are going through the same thing and you feel like you're not alone. And then yeah. to teach them, just like you are to teach them different ways to naturally balance their hormones and different things they could do to balance their hormones. Because so many women, so many people I know didn't know what to do when their hormones were off, you know, and they just settled for it. They just let it happen. The mood swings, the, you know, the, the hot flashes, you know, the, their sexual, you know, um, libido going down everything, you know, they just, they just accepted it, but they didn't, yeah. they didn't do anything about it, but yeah. they have to, you know, it, 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 it's important for women to know that you can change this, you know, you can, you can change the way you feel, you can balance your hormones and you can feel like you're 10, 15, 20 years younger, just by balancing your hormones, your energy level goes up because fatigue sets in and all that other good stuff, you know, that we don't like, you know, and when you balance your hormones, you feel like a new person and yeah so many natural ways to do it, you know, and it's so important to understand what's going on and what you could do about it. You know, so I, I commend you. I think it's really great. I think that program is, is amazing because I think a lot of women would, you should, should go to there. So just repeat that program one more time. So people know the balance challenge. Yeah. So it's a 28 day course. And so there's a content that you will get instant access to, and you'll have lifetime access to. And that is basically like hormones 101, what's going on with my hormones, a really like deep understanding of estrogen and progesterone, what's going on with perimenopause and menopause. And then I take you through cycle syncing, which is holistically supporting your nutrition, your lifestyle, and your exercise that should fluctuate in order to, to boost certain hormones and to detox certain hormones. We talked about how important it is to detox estrogen. I didn't know that before I went down the hormone rabbit hole that we actually need to detox estrogen. So yeah. I coach women during ovulation phase when our estrogen is peaking, we are dry brushing, we are going to hot yoga, we are sweating, we are getting in saunas, we are eating cruciferous vegetables to try and detox as much estrogen as possible. And yeah. we'll start to feel amazing and a lot of women i would re recommend too like 
they want to know like, am I in perimenopause or am I not? And do I need to get blood work and find out exactly what my hormones are doing? And it's like, none of that. I mean, go for it if you want to, but just starting to live in a cycle syncing method where you are tuning into what your body needs hormonally and you are using food as medicine and using Mm -hmm. lifestyle and self-care, then all of a sudden you're like, you'll just start feeling better and you don't need to measure it. It's not like, oh, I want to see a big improvement in my estrogen or my progesterone. You're going to feel it. You're going to be in tune and you're going to see your symptoms. These things that we've been believing are like a given in life, like sore boobs and bloating and like raging out on people. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't have to experience that. Mm -hmm. And that is so empowering. And that's the message I want to give to women. And so this, the balance challenge is the course for you. If that's what you're interested in, it's only $48 for a 28 day course. And also I will, um, I'm going to drop this too. I have an affiliate program. So if you want to join the program for $48 and you start referring other people to it, you I'll kick back $20 to you for every single friend that you get to sign up. Um, so it's a really cool thing. You'll get an email once you sign up with the affiliate link, but basically challenges are way better with friends, right? And what women don't, you know, that aren't complaining about hormone imbalance and like, I'm tired, I'm bloated. I I'm raging out. I have breakouts, you know, everybody. And so this is just like a really great foundational course to start creating awareness of what your body needs, some support around the alcohol piece. If that is something that you're hung up on. And, and then, you know, using this to really fine tune your hormone balance all month long. And you're going to see such an improvement. I'm going into my fifth cycle now without symptoms, which is bananas to me that I, that I'm like, my boobs aren't sore and I haven't like screamed at somebody. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So repeat your, your website again too. So everybody here, your website findmyselffree.com. And that is also my podcast is findmyselffree.com on Apple. And um, the two courses, the balance challenge is what we were just talking about. That is the hormone balancing program. And the brave course is a more in-depth course going through this air method, breaking down the beliefs, you know, attacking the habit of drinking and, you know, building a life you don't have to escape from. Awesome. This has been amazing. I think, you know, I think what you're doing is amazing. I think, you know, these are things that women really need to pay attention to. You know, it's really important, you know, both men and women to understand what alcohol does to your body and to understand that you could be happy, you could be joyful, you could have a good time, but you don't have to drink, you know, to have a good time and feel good about yourself, you know, and for the, for the menopause part, I think that's so important because, you know, when you go through perimenopause and menopause, even in the beginning, when I went through perimenopause, I didn't even know I was going through it. I was just, my body was changing so rapidly and I didn't know what was happening. And I had no clue because I never experienced these symptoms before. And then I didn't know what to do about them to stop them, you know? So it was scary, you know? So I think women really have to really tap into it, learn about it, and then find solutions and not just sit back and just let it occur, be proactive, you know? So I commend you for what you do. And I thank you so much for this episode. This was amazing. And I'm so glad you came on today to share this. Thank you. Thank you. It means the world to me to have this opportunity. So I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You have a great day, Ellie. Thank you, Stacey. I'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.